frequency and the scale of the disasters have been uh, phenomenal uh, and uh, of course a lot of them um, induced by the changing climate uh, but also there is a interconnectedness of various crises you know we have the climate induced crisis you have migration crisis of course and the conflict sort of comes in between to to make them more compounded crises is uh, the, the domestic mobilization of support. Because what we found is many of the countries actually have a decent capacity in their own countries. Uh, so we have sort of flipped the, the response mechanism upside down. So the first priority is domestic mobilization. And then the international mobilization comes in complementarity. Sort of the focus we want to uh, put moving forward uh, because uh, at the end of the day the sustainable response is always a domestic response. What we have done is uh, we, we develop a specific expertise in different countries. Uh, for example, you know, it would be Canada and Norway and Japan when it is a health-related capacity need. If it is a logistics capacity, it would be Austria and Switzerland. So we have sort of worked together as a, as a family uh, to develop those capacities so not everybody is investing on every capacity because then it becomes uh, not very cost-efficient model. important that we also don't take away the human element. You know, if somebody has lost a family, people need a shoulder to cry. 
and that can be provided only by humans. The technology can facilitate the work, it, can, it, it, it does facilitate the assessments and, and all those type of things. But, but we cannot take the human element completely away because at the end of the day, human being likes to be touched and felt by another human being. So that's the approach we take. But we, we increasingly use the technology. Um, especially when I look at Cote d'Ivoire and Africa, is the skill gap. So you have a lot of young people who get the degrees, but at the end of the day, when what they know and what they know how to do does not match with what the employment world requires, they end up having to, you know, get into the informal world. When you go to the rural areas, the quality of education is missing. Sometimes lack of um, proper schools, um, lack of universities. And then again, every time, as I always say, if there's a skills mismatch, if there's a problem, it's always worse for women. So again, poverty always comes in the middle of all of it. By default, your average young person is at a disadvantage when kickstarting their career today. Start with your work experience. Typically, catch 22, you need experience to get experience. Second, when it comes to education, less than 38%, according to UNESCO, benefit from a privileged higher education. And third, unless your parents are well connected, you're not connected. Everybody requires putting in uh, 20, 24 years of, I mean, uh, or going through that conventional trajectory of school and high school uh, and college education. How do we focus on vocational training? How do we recognize, um, focus on, build better uh, systems for um, areas such as traditional knowledge and traditional training um, in countries like India? This could be our biggest opportunity to level the playing field as we transition from a knowledge-based economy to a skills-based economy. But this only works if AI is, and the AI age, becomes an inclusive moment. Education is the strongest, biggest weapon you will ever have. It will open all of the doors that you need and it will bring food to your table. So take education very seriously, um, invest in that. I know it's not always easy at first, um, spending all that time um, studying, um, working hard, uh, but also look out for people who've done it already. Look for mentors, um, try to be inspired. It is amazing that a country as Mexico, with 120 million people, has about 1 million people who have suffered an amputation. What we have seen is that of those about 1 million people, 90% will have a low lower body amputation, mostly due to diabetes, which has affected the total population of Mexico a lot. One of the consequences of suffering an amputation at the age of 50 is that they still have a long way to go in their lives. 
on average, we will live about 75 years old. So this represents 25 year, more years of life that they will probably use a prosthesis and they also still need to bring something to the table at their homes, even with this new lifestyle. With what we do, we're able to increase even by six times the chance of obtaining a prosthesis to be able to walk again with it. And we do this with more than high tech, I, I, I like to say high quality, because high quality is what is really needed. Till today, we have been able to support more than 700 people with a prosthesis to walk again. This represents doubling the government from our state support to the amputees. We actually help more than 63% of them to get back to their homes again, even if it's working again or working at home and doing the duties at home. We could be preventing 80% of the cases of amputations because of diabetes if we work and we decide to put our attention into it. <laughs>